Okay. So yeah, my name is Rumina and I like to say for myself that I'm playful digital artisan making a more user-friendly future, even if it's just pixel by pixel. I love visualizing data, cycling, smell of pine trees and pandas. Three years ago I worked 90 hours per week and I like to say that I was obsessed with managing time. Everything from meeting my friends um, to fitness was scheduled. And I didn't want to miss anything, but in fact I missed everything. Because I worked on amazing projects with incredibly talented people, overworking became addictive. And then boom, I got restless, sick with all sorts of blood infection and without energy and spirit um, to do anything. So I wasn't really looking forward to anything and it was a burnout. And after a while, I asked myself, how can I make user-friendly interfaces if I'm not self-friendly? And how can I be self-friendly if I worked 90 hours per week? Sadly, Slovenia spends 1.2 billion euros per year because of stress, which makes it 13,000 euros per employee per year. And that's crazy. So today I'm going to talk about how to prevent burnout and why I think that self-friendly person can do better user-friendly interfaces. So we can ask ourselves, is being self-friendly working until you drop, waking up with coffee in your hands, not sleeping enough, eating junk food and not having enough time for yourself? No. So the question is how to find balance. And what word do you think goes in the blank? What is being self-friendly? So for me personally, there are a lot of them. First one, I would say, is having time for yourself. So the way to have a good life is to use time wisely. But how can we use time wisely? Well, first, we need to be aware of the fact that time is li limited. And then try to be present and grateful so the, the purpose of self-care is to prioritize time for ourselves. So in UX, we would say that it's enough time to think about solutions. So if we have time for thinking about the solutions, we wouldn't do stuff like this. Why do we need a drop down like to infinite scroll for expiration date, which only takes like four numbers or the elevator, which button do you have to press? Up, if you want to go up the left one, the, the bottom one, you don't know. And I don't even want to spend uh, time commenting the other two solutions. So is this icon for RSS or Wi-Fi? Well, clearly it's the wrong icon. And imagine entering a phone number with clicking <laughs> like this. I mean, it's crazy. Users don't have time to solve our puzzles. So we can say that we're losing both time and money with products that don't provide any solutions and are really hard to use. So you have to think about user and solution. And you still have to try to figure out what works for them, but still try to finish the product development cycle as fast as possible so you can get users' feedback. Then next one is making good decisions. We all know that our life is made out of million decisions, but still most people are just drifting, which means that they haven't taken command of their life or mind yet. And what is drifting? Drifting is when you let external circumstances determine where you will go in life. So indecision is actually your pot uh, potentially your greatest threat, because when you have to decide, you're somehow stuck. So you cannot let your users drift for, oh, this might be a proper button. Let's press it and see what will happen. And imagine taking decisions from this software. Well, it's hard. And this is actually a true story. It's a story about Jenny. Three nurses were using this software and they missed a very critical piece of information. Jenny was supposed to be given three days of hydration, but nurses still experienced, missed it. Because this is the button on the top right where you have an arrow. 
So when the nurse came in the next morning, Jenny has already died because they missed it and she wasn't given the hydration. Um, and she died of toxicity and dehydration. So yes, UX can also solve a lot of problems. Then set it and forget it principle. We all know it. You just set it and forget it, but in reality it's completely different. And it's the same with BMVW. They introduced a new smart key, which you can use for turning your AC on, even for parking your car. And they say that key functions should be used for at least three months without charging the key, but reality is different. It lasts way less. So users have to think about, oh my God, how I should charge my key unless I won't be able to use my car. I mean, crazy. Then traffic jams. Yes, we have a lot of people, we have a lot of cars, more and more, and this picture is from London, but still traffic jams are everywhere. But why can't we solve these issues? Because of the system, lack of organization, lack of money, I mean, a lot of reasons. So let's do things right with the right resources. Because useful automatized systems mean less management, more confidence, more free time, and of course more flexibility, and that's what we need. But to do this, great, and to provide great user experiences, we have to anchor it in our purpose, because if we know what's our purpose, we can connect it to strategy, people, rewards, we can measure it, so everything's connected, and our implementation will succeed, because without purpose, we will never know is this going the right way or not. Then the next one for me is loving. Loving your friends, family, hobbies, so whatever you do in life. I believe you have to, do, you have to give full, undistracted attention to important people in your life. Because you cannot achieve anything great if you don't know what you're doing. So the formula for success is consistency driven by the deep love of the work that you do. And I believe you don't want to be like most of the people in government when they get a task. So, like, oh no, I have to work. This is a joke, but still, <laughs> if we imagine this woman um, f uh, making the guy fill in the form, but in this particular moment when he comes in, it's not important if he fills in the form or not. It's just, okay, we will proceed in something different, you know. Then making changes. Yeah, there's a lot of changes in our life. And to do changes, we have to change our routines, break monotony, and move. So we have to make a major change whenever we can. And on the other hand, we, we shouldn't be so wired to find patterns because some things in life are just random and we, don't, we will never find a reason for that. So when you're making changes to your app or website, you have to decide whether you want to gradually change it or radically change it. And it's not, I believe it's not always smart to shock users with completely changing the layout and uh, position of every button. But we have to decide. Perhaps Microsoft first incrementally changed their layout, but then in a sudden they just changed completely everything, which was, I guess, okay. Then if we check Nintendo, they were the best in 80s for in the game market. And they already uh, experienced a downturn, downturn until they released a revolutionary Nintendo V. Um, so they introduced the radical idea of using game console as a physical medium, and it generated new meaning, and people really loved it. But on the other hand, Sony and Microsoft were focusing on incremental improvements for their uh, Xbox and PlayStation, and they wanted to do better speed and graphics. So in this case, Nintendo was better. Then it was the same with Apple. They didn't change overnight. You know, first it was an iPod and a better one, a touch screen, and then in 2007, they introduced iPhone, which changed the industry. 
Then the interesting example for me is Xiaomi. I don't know if, they, if you know them, but they are fifth largest smartphone maker um, based in China, and they got this status only in five years. So the interesting part is how they make their operating system. Currently, they have more than 100 million users, but they only sold 30 million phones. And it's crazy because every weekend, users can download their operating system, and you can um, provide your feedback, your um, suggestions for improvements. And then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they work on these improvements required by users. On Thursdays, they have uh, internal tests, and on Friday, you get a new um, so public beta. And it's cool because they're behind their success, it's a lot of work and thoughts. And of course, you cannot do this if you have a really small company. But they can do it because they want it to engage users and really make user-friendly interface for them. Then continuously learn. I know, when I, well, when I say learn, you immediately think about your shiny bookshelf. But no, I didn't mean that. Last decade thinking was, OK, we will do version 1, and we will do version 2 if we have money, and then ooh, we will celebrate. It's a party. We will never go back to changing our layout, our interface. We will just debug the system and change it. But we all know, in theory, everything works. But reality is a bit different. So we have to try, <laughs> and we have to fail. And then, only then, we will succeed. So my suggestion is, whenever you're working on something and you have a hypothesis, you have to experiment, and then you have to measure. And only when you measure it, you can manage it. And then you have to move in cycles. So you have to research continuously. It never ends. And you have to involve those who have power in the design process. And for that, I really like to use design-driven development. So it's actually four stages. First stage is you have to have a plan, and then you have to make a research. And then you do wireframes and prototype, and you can move up or down. It depends what you find out. The next stage is design, and then architecture and development of the system. Then when everything works and you're kind of ready to launch the product, you will make a marketing plan, and then you will launch. But in between all these four stages, you have to measure, and of course, feedback is needed. You have to perform the user test. You have to find out, is this the right way? Is, are users happy with what you're doing? Because customers today have a lot of choice. There are a lot of products that are almost the same, maybe just some differences. So it's important to track and uh, change processes if needed, and you have to always track your uh, imperfection, maybe there are some defects. And um, I think that you always have to include different people from your team to change, I mean, that you have a cross-functional team, because only in that case you will hear different perspectives, and you will create better openness and feedback. So we could say that UX design is not only about designing, but also coordinating, facilitating, and enabling. Then next one is prioritizing. You know, whatever you choose in life, there's always opportunity costs. So being obsessed how to choose the best wife, the best girlfriend, boyfriend, the best career, the best coffee, is going to drain your energy. Because perfect doesn't exist, and it's like chasing the horizon. But still, if we fail to relate our design work to the business bottom line, that's a real problem. And because in life, we all want to focus on right things. And there's always more things uh, in a day that day has hours. So it's important to choose our activities wisely. And uh, to do this, uh, we use this method called priority metrics. And we ask ourselves, how important is this feature or activity for our user? 
Are they using it all of the time and all of the people? So this is our superstar feature. Or little time, very few people. So you have to examine your process and take a look at how currently someone gets the job done. Then you have to list all the activities and all the features and sort them by, okay, this is a must, nice to have or not needed. And then, additionally, you can also sort them by potential revenue, so ROI. Because user needs and business needs have to be connected. If they are not, of course, user needs are important, but if they don't drive any business, then nothing will exist. If we compare Booking.com and Airbnb, both have the same outcome. You know, you have to find the room or apartment, you have to book it. But if we check Booking, there are a lot of sections, a lot of focus, like on the left, right, everywhere. You don't even know where to click. But if you check the Airbnb, you ha they, are, they ask you where you want to go, you have input field for a place and for a date, and you just press OK, search. But on the other hand, if you don't know where you want to go, they still have some um, suggestions for, experiment, for experiences um, and for places. So um, if you will know, you will search. If you don't know, you will browse. But you know how they say, if you don't know where you want to go, every wind is favorable. And you can have the world's best design, but if you don't know how to explain the decisions behind it, the design will never get improved or it will never work in, work in real life. And then last one is trust. So trust is everywhere. It's actually present in every moment. It, it starts with you. When you can trust yourself, you're not going to make any real decisions. Then, then we have also social trust, which is the belief in integrity, honesty, and reliability of others. Uh, so it's actually belief in people. But it's not just about people. When you wake up, you believe that water will come out of the pipe. You believe that your car will work, wor will work. then that you have a good coffee, and that bridge won't break, so it's everywhere. But imagine that you have a candy from this van. Would you take it? I don't think so, even if it's for free, because good design instills trust and credibility. And good design also provides solution. Imagine going to Google and you want to go to Hawaii and Google would say, oh, I don't know what this guy wants. So people will give up if you don't provide solution for them and they will just go somewhere else. Then this uh, example is cool for WhatsApp. So whether you're on internet or not, they change the icon. If you're offline, the icon is red. When you're online, the icon is green. So it's cool because you know, oh, my messages are not sent because I'm not on the internet. Then Spotify notifies us when uh, we have duplicates in our playlist, which is also useful. But then there are also dark patterns which are used to place to trick the user into doing something they don't want to do. So the most famous example is by LinkedIn. I guess a lot of you have LinkedIn and you already registered. So on onboarding, you have to approve social permissions and your email. And then they send messages claiming it's from you. Hello, join the network and you will get news connections, friends. And the interesting part is that they had to pay the fine of 13 million because they were using unsolicited emails. So dark patterns are bad design and bad design is bad business. And this one is interesting. So Rumina, pl please do us a solid and disable your ad blocker. Thanks for supporting Wired. Oh yeah, I will immediately do this because you, are, you have so many interesting ads. No. <laughs> It's a trick, and we all know that. <laughs> so remember, I told you that Slovenia spins, spends 1.2 billion euros per year because of stress. But there's also a good side of it. If companies would spend only one euro per employee, they would get back two to five euros in three years of time. Why is that? Because employees would be 20% more productive when they're healthy. 
So what's being self-friendly? Well, you know what your blank words are, because self-care looks different for every one of us. And you have to do what works for you and when it works for you. And in your pursuit of self-care, remember to be gentle with yourself and not to lose sight of your goals, because you will, cons you will make more powerful decisions when you will be consistently in more powerful conditions. And don't be afraid what you did or didn't do, just define life now. So I suggest you go out and have fun. <laughs>